Amen. Great. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, again, keep praying for Brother Russell and his family so that they can have a safe delivery with their uh, child. But uh, yes, it's great to be back here. I love Tucson. And uh, what I'm preaching on today, the title of my sermon today is The, the Automatic Cost Savings of Le Living a Clean Life. Now, that's kind of a mouthful. The Automatic Cost Savings of Living a Clean Life. What I want to preach on today is something I haven't really preached before. It's a different format than what I'm you know, usually used to. What I'm going to do is basically list off automatic ways that by living a clean life, you can save money. Now, this is kind of an interesting way to, to take it, and I want to be really clear and careful how I present this, because nobody should become a Christian to save money. Nobody should, should do that. That's the wrong, if that's what you get out of this sermon, that's the wrong message there. So that's not what I'm emphasizing at all. What I'm assuming is that 99% of everybody here is saved, you know, with that free gift of eternal life. You're going to go to heaven when you die because Jesus paid for all your sins. You're trusting in Him and not yourself. You know, if Jesus paid for all your sins, what's left for you to pay for? Nothing. You know, praise God for that. It's a free gift. But what I want to preach on today is basically, you know, if you were to go into the world uh, and, 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 you know, maybe you, you wanted to learn about saving some money. Say, hey, I want to save some money. How can I do it? The world would tell you, you know, stop shopping at Starbucks or stop going out to Starbucks, you know, make your coffee at home or whatever. They'll tell you to do this or that. But what I want to show you is that if you are a Christian, if you commit to being a Christian to the Christian lifestyle, the Baptist lifestyle, for example, there's automatically a ton of savings involved, which is good news. Now, the other way I could t uh, title this sermon, the alternative that I thought about titling it would be uh, basically, the, the financial cost of sin. For, and we'll get into this in the sermon here, but if you were to fall into a major sin, you know, let you be warned that you're going to have to pay a lot of money. You're going to lose your money, and way worse than that. And so let's go ahead and take a look at, at Matthew, or sorry, Luke chapter 14, because I want to show you that you know, to become a Christian, you should really count the cost. So verse 26, Matthew, uh, sorry, I keep saying Matthew. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. You have to hate everybody. This is by comparison. Love Christ first. By comparison, hate everybody else. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him, or with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So what I want to say here, and just in case anybody's visiting, if you want to be a Christian, count the cost. You could lose your job. You could lose your whole family. Your, family, your wife could leave you. That's happened before in our church. Uh, you could lose you know, all your old friends. That's probably happened to most people here. Uh, you could lose just about everything. And you probably should be, I mean, the Bible's saying here, you should be prepared to lose all for the, for the for cost of Christ. And that's exactly what we need to have. But I'm going to show you through this sermon that if you forsake all, there's still a ton of savings. <laughs> You're still going to save a lot of money living a clean life. And I hope this is a fun sermon for everybody. And now go ahead and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. <clears throat> Count the cost of becoming a Christian. We're going to jump into the savings here in a minute. But God forbid that somebody would try to become a Christian without Christ and come to be a Christian just for the savings. I don't want to give you the wrong idea. And sometimes people will say, you know, come to God, he'll make your life better. And they basically say, you know, God is a means to an end. Well, I messed up my life. I'm on drugs. I got to get my life straightened out. And I'm going to come to God because God's going to help me sober up. You should come to God. You should sober up. Those are good things to do. But you should want to come to Christ for Christ. Think about it like this, for example, you know, why do you want to go to heaven? I'm assuming everybody here is really excited to go to heaven. I hope you are. Why do you want to go to heaven? Is it because it's not hell? That's a valid answer. Is it because heaven is paradise? That's a valid answer. 
But a mature Christian, the real answer for why you'd want to go to heaven is to be with God, to be with your Creator, to meet your Savior face to face. That's the sign of a mature Christian for that right reason. Now, by all means, escape hell. <laughs> you know, there's all those other reasons to, to come to, to Christ. But there's a real Christ, and that's that, that, that the end is God is not the means to an end, like a quick rit- way to get rich, you know, Joel Osteen, but come to Christ to, to come to know God and to know Him. That's true value there. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, let's look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we, for we brought nothing into this world, and is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You know, there's nothing better than just being content with whatever you have. You don't need to get rich quick. You don't need to do whatever. I'm going to teach you how you're going to save money, but you don't need to get money in the first place. We don't care about the money. It's not about the money, folks. But they, let's keep reading verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and partition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, I, I don't, don't turn there and I'm going to misquote it, but in the book of Proverbs, it talks about how the, the, the man who goes out and works in the field, he sleeps good, he sleeps great. But the man who's got all these riches can't go to sleep at night because he's thinking, oh man, how do I not lose my riches? How do I keep all my riches? You strive not to be rich. I wouldn't even worry about it. But the Christian life has savings. The other thing uh, from, from Proverbs that's really funny or interesting is that uh, I'm going to just paraphrase it because I don't have it memorized. But there's a saying where the rich man has all these riches and when he gets taken kidnapped, or when he's kidnapped, he can pay the ransom. And so he, hindsight, he's probably saying, wow, I'm so glad I got all that wealth because then I could pay my ransom and save my life. But the poor man never gets kidnapped in the first place. The poor man has nothing to worry about. Nobody's breaking into my car. There's nothing in there. You know, it's, it's, it's just a different mentality to have. Uh, let's keep reading. Verse 17. Charge them that are rich. So jump down to verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they, be, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. The Bible's saying here, if you're rich, you know, there's nothing wrong with being rich. It's not a sin to be rich, but you shouldn't strive to be rich. And if you want to be rich too quickly, you know, that's the root of all evil. You're going to do something bad. When I was a kid, there was a show on Nickelodeon. It was, what would you do for a dollar? And they would take these kids, and what would you do for a dollar? The kid's like, well, I'd you know, put a bunch of ants up my nose or something for a dollar. And I remember thinking, like, this is gross. This is not good. But that generation, you know, my generation watched, what would you do for a dollar? And next thing you know, you get shows like Fear Factor, where somebody's got so many poisonous snakes on their face. And you know, people get hurt in those, in those game shows. They get rushed to the hospital. It's not good. And you shouldn't strive to be quick, rich. And so go ahead and flip with me back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. I want to just show you something. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And there's going to be a lot of Bible tonight. I've got to warn you that we're going to be flipping all over. So maybe I'll spare you a few of them. Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> you know, G- serving the Lord, it, it makes sense because eternal life is free. Praise God. Jesus did all the work. Look at what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter uh, 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, the, the, the Christian life is something that is so easy to do. It's so easy. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be big and strong. You don't have to be, you know, certain good looking or not. Anybody can come. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. My wife and I often reflect on the, the idea. We went on a, a soul winning marathon in the Los Angeles uh, Compton soul winning marathon. Did anybody here go to that? The one you did? It was awesome. But I remember thinking, you know, this marathon, I, I was looking at the itinerary and I'm thinking, man, we got to get up early and we're going to be here and we're going to rush over here and have breakfast and then drive over here and get soul, you know, the soul winning ac- activities. And then we're rushing here and then we're going to the mall and then we're going to get food and then we're going to go to the beach and we're going to do all this stuff. And I remember thinking, like looking at the itinerary, thinking this is going to be one heck of a weekend. This is going to be pretty stressful. 
And, you know, then we're going to go back to work on Monday, you know, the very next day. But the reality is, is that serving the Lord and that soul winning trip, even though we're out there soul winning and preaching and, you know, doing this and doing that and fellowshipping, I felt more rested than as if I had gone on a two week vacation or some sort of long vacation flying around with my baggage, you know, where's the rental car? <laughs> you know, all that stuff is more stressful. Serving the Lord, my, my, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. I got that switched. So let's get into the sermon here. I'm going to show you how being a Christian, living a clean life, will save you a ton of money. And the underlining statement here, the, under, the understatement here is that it will save you a lot more than that, a lot more pain. Uh, if you meet someone and, you know, there's a saying that person has a lot of baggage, or that person, you know, they look like they've lived a really hard life. That's usually, you know, a phrase, a, a euphemism for meaning that person has been a very sinful person. You know, maybe it's the, the drug addict derelict on the street there. You know, they sleep in whenever they want, right? There's no responsibility, no rules, but they don't look well rested. They look like they've lived a hard life. And so living a clean life will save you a lot of money, but it's not about the money, folks. It's way more than that. It's way more. But I I'm, I'm want to preach this as if it's some sort of savings class, some sort of way to save a lot of money. Okay, go ahead and go to uh, Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 20, 23. The first point we're going to look at here is the commandment to be sober. Proverbs chapter 23. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, but living a sober, clean life, teetotaling, not touching any alcohol, will save you a fortune. <laughs> it will save you a lot of money. I went to school for hotel restaurant management, and we learned that in the hotel restaurant industry, one glass of wine pays for the entire bottle for the restaurant. Give up drinking, you'll save a ton of money. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 23. Who hath woe? This is 20, Proverbs 23, verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go that seek mixed wine. Look thou not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adler. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. And they, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. The Bible is describing here somebody who's a, you know, basically a raging alcoholic, seeking the, the alcohol, and they're holding on to the mast. You know, it'd be like, a, like, like, whoa, why is the room spinning? It's like, it's not spinning, my friend. You know, why, why, why is there two bartenders? There's only one. You know, it, it's not good. And so the Bible's saying here, who hath woe, who has sorrow? Alcohol will ruin your life. I'm, I've already preached this in the past. But the commandment, let me just read it for you. First Peter, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know, it, it's kind of a shame to just get up and say, you know, avoid alcohol because you're going to save a lot of money. But that's true. Avoid alcohol. Just don't even drink it. What a waste of money. Even a financial person would say, hey, oh, you want to retire? You know, we better give up alcohol. You know, give up the cigarettes. We'll get to that in a second. But the, the truth is, is that if you were to give up alcohol, think about alcohol. Every time you, you were to take a drink or steal the, the liquor from the liquor cabinet or whatever, you're basically pl playing some sort of Russian roulette. You could die. You could, you know, commit some horrible sin like adultery, which we'll, we'll cover most of these later on. But just merely saving alcohol will save you a ton of money. Don't do it. I got this statistic here. Drinking alcohol, according to the, the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Americans spend about 1% of their gross annual income on alcohol. The for the average household, that's $565 a year, or $5,650 in 10 years, wh a whopping $22,000 over a 40-year period. Who would like to save $22,000? You know, something Pastor Anderson is known for saying is that the Christian life is not measured in weeks or in years. It's measured in decades. So if you, you know, live the Christian life, even if you've already, you know, messed up in your past, if you live the Christian life, you can save, what this is saying, $22,000. And that's just the money aspect. And again, it's not about the money, folks. You're saving way more, you know, sickness or pain, or you could even die. I'd rather save much more than that. 
Go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The second one on my list here is, is smoking cigarettes and drugs. I, I don't know why I combine these two together, but basically smoking and drugs. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, I'll start reading. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God and are not of your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I don't know if anyone's taken a, a, a class on this, but the body is not meant to digest nutrients through your lungs. <laughs> it's, even, if, even if you made the case that tobacco is some you know, ancient history, uh, historical herb used for healing, and, and I have heard this where people get a cut and they wrap their arm in tobacco or something and, you know, wet it and, and it gets peeled over time. I've never heard of anyone actually doing that, but I've heard that that could be a thing. The point is, even if you did think that tobacco somehow had some nutrient that would be so healthy for you, consuming it through hot burning amber is not going to help you help your lungs at all. It's, it's just, you know, maybe eat it, you could say. I'm not saying that from the pulpit, but... The, God gave us the thing. It's here for some reason. Maybe it's like coronavirus when there's a toilet paper shortage. It's a pretty big leafy thing. <laughs> I don't know what its purpose is. What I'm trying to say is that consuming nutrients through your lungs is not going to help you at all. And so I don't know how much a pack of cigarettes uh, comes, but I, I asked my grandmother, who I don't know if is, is going to ever watch this. My grandmother smokes uh, one pack of cigarettes a day, and I'm just assuming it's cost $5 per pack. Because there's all these sin tax, they call it a sin tax, where the government's trying to get you to stop smoking, so they go ahead, they know you're addicted, so they charge you, you know, five dollars a pack when they only cost one dollar. I don't know how much it costs, but I did some math here: five dollars a day times six, three hundred sixty-five dollars. Uh, sorry, five dollars a day times one year, three hundred sixty-five days, is one thousand eight hundred and twenty-five dollars. I mean, that's a, that adds up. If you multiply that times 50 years, you know, that's just short of $100,000. That's $91,000 for a habit. And so that's why they say, you know, hey, the first one's free, bud. That's because they're going to get you to pay for the rest of them, you know, forever and ever. And that's just cigarettes. I don't even, I don't even know the cost of drugs, but I'm sure it's, it's much worse. Don't ever do it. Save the money. Look, go ahead and flip over to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 20, 23, we're going to talk about gluttony, uh, junk food, people who... You know, just love to eat, 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 eat. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. A drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. This is a very interesting verse here, but I believe the Bible. The Bible makes it very clear. A drunkard and a glutton shall come to poverty. So I didn't do any math calculations here. I don't know what the cost of junk food is or what the cost of a bag of Cheetos or something like that. But I do know that junk food is more expensive than nutrient-dense food because it's completely empty. Imagine this, right? You know, you're, you're so hungry. Wow, I have a God-given desire to eat food, so I'm going to eat Cheetos and Cheetos and Cheetos. Eat, eating, 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 eating. But the body says, wait a minute, we're looking for vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C. Do you have anything like that up there? You know, we're not getting it, so we're going to keep triggering that you're hungry. You know, what about the, the healthy fats? You know, the, the omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-9s. There's all these things. The body's saying, hey, we need this food. Keep it coming because maybe it's going to be in the next course. But if you just keep eating junk food, you're getting nothing. So what does that mean? That means you're not going to be satisfied. Even if you filled up on all this junk food, your body's getting zero. And so therefore, it's as if you're getting nothing. You haven't eaten anything at all, even though you have. So that's why the glutton shall come to poverty. I mean, that's just one way to explain it. Uh, don't go ahead and turn to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me read for you before we move on. Proverbs chapter 30, uh, verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies, and give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. The, the prayer here is that you, you pray, God, give me neither poverty or riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be fool and deny thee. This is basically saying, just give me what I need. That vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, give me what I need. Give me the minerals. And you'd be surprised if you eat a healthy diet, all of a sudden you're not hungry anymore. This is why people who, you know, sometimes can skip breakfast because their body ends up burning the fat, you know, kind of like a fasting. Skip breakfast, they burn the fat. Next thing you know, they're not hungry until lunchtime. And they have all this energy. It's because the body's able to eat itself and eat the fat on itself. 
It's a beautiful thing, the human body. God did us good. Okay, let's change gears. Dating for the wrong reasons. This is a nice way to say dating for the wrong reasons. This is basically the, the, the whoremonger, the person who goes out you know, to date a, you know, a, a, a female for the wrong reasons, if you understand what I'm saying. They date them, and, and it's a very expensive thing. They keep dating one, and then dating another, and then dating another, and then dating another. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and, and in your spirit, which are God's. The Bible makes it very clear, flee fornication. Now, I've already preached a whole sermon on fleeing fornication, uh, so I won't re-preach that sermon. But, you know, one tidbit that I've learned, you know, when I was in high school or, or when I was uh, in, in college, people, typically, you know, the fraternity types, would go out and they'd be spending all this money. They'd be spending it t trying to take a woman to a bar, trying to get her, you know, drunk, and just spending money after uh, dollar after dollar after dollar, going to the club, you know, some stinking room that smells gross, going to a karaoke bar where people can't sing at all. You know, they would spend all this money and invest so much time just to sin and ruin their life. They would spend so much time. They got to, you know, have the nice clothes. And there's all these videos about, you know, make sure you have a good watch and make sure you have, uh, you know, I don't know, the, 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 the shoes, you know, the Air Jordans or whatever. And you got to, you know, take her to this special place and spend $150 on a meal and, and basically wine them and dine them and all this stuff just to commit you know, fornication, just to commit some horrible sin, which will ruin your life and is completely vain. You know, dating for the wrong reasons, if you cut that out, all of a sudden you're going to save a ton of money. All of a sudden you're going to have all these savings. And, you know, it's not about the money, folks. Again, it's about more than that. Proverbs chapter 18. Go ahead and go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 18. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So dating for the wrong reasons implies dating for fornication, dating for some horrible, wicked sin, which will get you kicked out of this church, amen? But dating for the right reasons is looking for a wife, looking for someone to spend the rest of your life with, looking for someone to raise children, someone who's going to help you in, in your life, someone who's going to be a help meet for you, someone to trust and, and uh, basically help you. <clears throat> Proverbs 31, verse 30, Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. If you jump up to verse 10, Proverbs 31, verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Now that's an interesting term there. What does it mean, no need of spoil? Spoil would be like a, a bonus. You say, you know, <laughs> pretend that you're... This, you know, I don't know anybody who has this, but pretend that your, your wife, you know, you married this wife, and, and let's just say, this is hypothetical, but let's say you married a very beautiful woman for the wrong reasons. You just married her for whatever, because she looks really beautiful, in which b the Bible says beauty is vain. But the wife that you happen to marry because she's so beautiful, you know, she's got this credit card spending problem where she's just racking up all these charges, swiping the credit card, shopping with, you know, some Beverly Hills shopping bag. Well, that husband's going to say, oh, man, I've got all these bills. My wife has racked up all these credit cards. I'm going to, what's my hope? I need a bonus at the end of the year to help pay for all these things. Think of your end of the year bonus as like spoil. Basically, uh, you know, you've got your regular farm. You've got your regular ranch. You've got your cattle, your chickens, all this stuff. And then you go out to war. Typically, you know, if you killed all your enemies, you would take their stuff as spoil. You would take that stuff as like a bonus. And what he's saying here is that who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. Her husband does safely trust in her so that he hath no need of spoil. Verse 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. If you read Proverbs 31, this woman actually has a little side business and she's making money for the husband. So um, let's put it together. On one hand, you've got the, you know, the, the fornicator trying to date for the wrong reasons, wasting all this money, going to ruin his life. On the other hand, you've got the guy, you know, the Baptist guy in our church looking for the right woman who's going to help him raise children and save money and also make money with a little side business. You know, Mrs. Anderson has, she sells her cookbooks. She has her little, uh, she sells her swimsuits. And I think, I think we probably have one or two 
she does a great service, I and mean, it's a great, a great thing to have. So who can find a virtuous woman? You know, dating for the right reasons. Now let's up the ante a little bit. Go to Exodus chapter 20. This is where the Ten Commandments are. We're going to talk about adultery. Adultery is financial suicide. Now let me be clear. If you commit adultery, you deserve to be put to death. So what do you care about money? If, if you're going to commit adultery, you should be killed. And that's according to the Word of God. And when Jesus comes back, that's going to be implemented again. I do know if you, if you are in the military and you commit adultery on your wife, you're going to go to military jail. I forget what that's called. But I, that's a, you know, kind of a double standard the military has where if your wife is not in the military and you are in the United States military and you commit adultery, you're going to go to jail. And your wife, if she commits adultery, you know, it's just California. Just nothing happens. It's just, it's just deal with it. You could do a divorce or whatever. But if you commit adultery, you deserve to be killed. You deserve to be punished. Both parties, both people. But the Bible talks a lot about committing adultery, and it says here that if you commit adultery, you're going to be brought to a piece of bread. I had you turn to uh, the commandment there in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. So, uh, uh, you know, a Baptist with a pure heart comes to this church, oh, wow, God says don't commit adultery, case closed. He doesn't need to be persuaded with, look at all the savings you're going to get if you don't commit adultery. That's why this is kind of silly to, to preach this. But there are savings. There, don't commit adultery because if you do this, and let this be a warning, if you were to do this, let's say that our wicked government doesn't put you to death, you're going to lose all your money. You're going to be brought to a piece of bread. I wish I kept, keep a finger there in Exodus because we're going to come back. Let me just read this for you. We're, we're flipping all around. This is Proverbs chapter 6. Turn there if you want. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. What does that mean, brought to a piece of bread? I have a loaf of bread in the car. I should have brought it up here. A piece of bread. I used to think that this meant like your intelligence would be like a piece of bread, you know, just like a loaf of bread. You, you idiot, you committed adultery. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about your substance. How much does a piece of bread cost? I mean, a piece of bread, a loaf of bread is, is what, $5? This is talking about you lost your house. You lost your car, you lost your job, you lost everything. Now you've got some disease. And how much do you have in your bank account? Well, you could buy a loaf of, a piece of bread, not even a loaf, a piece of bread. How much is that, like 10 cents? This is financial suicide. If you were to commit adultery, don't do it. <clears throat> Let me keep reading. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. She's out to get you and can make can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes be not burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? The answer is no, of course not. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief. If he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he, is, if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. That means you have to pay back sevenfold. You stole. Now you owe me seven times more than what you stole. He shall give all that he does, all the substance of his house. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. It's not about the money, it's about your soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and a reproach shall, be, shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will he rest content, though he, thou givest many gifts. You're like, I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry. Take my house, take my car, take everything. It's not going to do you any good. And you lose all your house and car and all that stuff. So adultery is financial death, financial suicide. And honestly, you should be put to death. <clears throat> Let me read for you Leviticus chapter 20. And just to prove my point in case anyone here doesn't know this. Leviticus 20 verse 10. And a man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So case closed. I mean, talk about savings. <laughs> Don't do it. <clears throat> Let me switch. Let's switch gears here. Go ahead and go to Proverbs chapter 5. But actually keep a finger there in Exodus chapter 20 because that's the Ten Commandments. We're going to be right back to the Ten Commandments. So Proverbs chapter 5, let's, let's change gears here because I, what I want to show you is that your wife is your only legitimate source of romance. So we're kind of just on this theme right now of, of not committing fornication, not dating for the wrong reasons, don't commit adultery, 
But I want to show you here that you should invest in your wife. Your wife is your only legitimate source of romance. Let me read for you Matthew chapter 5. But I say unto you, this is verse 28, But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. This is Jesus speaking. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. You know, many people don't mention this today, but today in our world, we, America especially, uh, and, and the Bible talks about this in Revelation, the, the city of Babylon, the great whore spreads her fornication across the world. The fornication. And I've always wondered, you know, what does that mean? Is it literal fornication? And, and for one part, it probably is. But I believe this is, you know, primarily the Hollywood movies, the pornography, the, the lustful videos that circulate all around. You know, it, it's, uh, it's quite a shame that this goes through. And what I want to show you is that your, you know, your wife is your only legitimate source of romance. So young men, you should be seeking a wife uh, to, to satisfy godly desires the right way. Uh, look at verse, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad, and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own, and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and the pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman, and embrace the bosom of a stranger? What I want to preach on, or, or the reason why I'm bringing this up, is because your wife is your only legitimate source of romance. And vice versa, for the wife, your husband's the only legitimate source of romance. So what does that mean? We're talking about money. That means you should probably spend a few money, a, a few dollars, uh, investing, go on a date, you know, to go do something fun, buy a nice rose, buy a nice thing, you know, do something nice, invest in that relationship because, you know, you need that relationship to avoid all these other savings. You could say, well, the, part, the crust of, uh, of flowers is too expensive. No, it's not. <laughs> you, know, you know, say you're sorry. You know, it's, mend that relationship. Invest in your relationship. She's your only source of legitimate source of romance. Drink waters out of that own cistern. <clears throat> okay, let me, let me read for you uh, Exodus chapter 20. Let's change gears here. I want to switch gears because... This doesn't really apply to us. We're going to talk about murder. Thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, 13. Thou shalt not kill. This, how can this save you money? You say, well, Brother Jake, you, you had me on the other ones, but how, how is this going to save me money? Well, if you commit murder, just like with adultery, you should be put to death. And so I guess the way this would save you money, you know, jokingly, it would be all the legal fees. I mean, honestly, you should just say you're guilty and, and you should be put to death. But I'll, I'll preach this because this would save our government a lot of money if they were to put people to death, which, of course, they don't do, which would save the taxpayers money. So if you ever get an opportunity to potentially vote for somebody who believes in capital punishment, maybe do that. But, you know, I, I'm not going to endorse any candidate. So uh, this is, let me read for you here. This is Numbers chapter 35 or 16, and, and I know we're flipping all around. It says, And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer, and the murderer shall surely be put to death. So this would save the government a lot of money because what they're doing is actually housing these murderers, housing pedophiles, housing people who should be put to death. And, you know, we're, I guess the, the taxpayers are paying for them, paying for the prison guards to watch them. You know, a bullet doesn't cost that much, my friend. It's, it's only so much money. If you murder someone, you're going to go to jail, which means you lose all your money. So don't murder. You can't earn anymore. Think about the opportunity cost, all the great things. You know, it's so stupid. Man, Manly Perry recently preached, and I'm sure you guys are aware of the controversy. He preached that Judas Iscariot got the most people saved, which is ridiculous. I mean, obviously, it's ridiculous in the sense that he wasn't saved himself. How could he get anybody saved when he's going to hell? Jesus clearly said it's better that he wasn't even born. But just what the argument that I haven't heard is that the guy only, he committed suicide. He lived Three years of, of soul winning, right? You didn't get anybody saved in that three years. But let's just say that, you know, John, the Apostle John, he lived four years. Or James, he lived a little bit longer. Wouldn't it make sense that the guy who lived four years, actively soul winning every day, would get more people saved than the guy who only lived three years? And what if you lived for a decade longer? What I'm trying to say here is that if you were to go to prison or go to jail, you can't make any more money anymore. 
So if you want to save money, don't go to jail. But does that make sense about uh, uh, Judas? The guy lived three years. He preached for three years, falsely, of course, and he's, he's dead. So how in the world could he get more people saved? <laughs> you know, it makes no sense. Math, Manly Perry, math. Not stealing. Uh, Exodus 20, 15. Thou shalt not steal. You know, the, the Christian sees this and says, wow, that's right. They don't need to be convinced in any other way. In Exodus chapter 22, if you just turn the page two, two, page, or two uh, chapters over, Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, if a, man's, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for, the, for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Now this is something that is so simple and so beautiful, but our system doesn't do this today at all. Imagine this, right? Imagine that you get your car stolen by somebody. And I don't know if you have an ox or a car, or an ox or a goat type of car, or a sheep. But let's just say you have a car, and somebody steals your car. You say, man, that's my life savings. You know, that was like five grand, and you know, my car is gone. Well, you know, that's, that's too bad. The guy drives it around, goes on a joyride. Let's say a w month goes by, six weeks goes by. They find the car, and they catch the guy. That happens. They catch carjackers, more so today. What this is saying is that the guy who stole the car from you now owes you five cars or four cars. So now you're thinking, wow, it was pretty tough to go to live without a car for five weeks, six weeks, a month, or, or two months. But now you have to pay me five cars? Hey, I feel like I've got some justice, right? I've got five cars now. Thank you very much. You stole my one. Now you owe me five. This is going to help make that guy more money. You know, this is going to encourage him. The system we have today, the government system today, is the guy steals your car, sucks to be you, bud. He goes to prison. He pays the, you know, the, the, the money or whatever to the, to the, to the, to the prison, if, if he works at all, free labor. And then you, through taxes, take care of this guy for the rest of your life. That's a failed system right there. That's a failed system. And, and something that I'm really kind of keeping my ears and eyes open, this system of, that we have in America is so laughable. It's so messed up that I'm almost worried that when the Antichrist comes in power, he's going to change some systems here, and people are going to say, wow, that makes a lot more sense. But not like I'm going to go serve the Antichrist, but this American system of not punishing someone and not restoring you know, the thing. If the guy got his car stolen, drives it and destroys it, he just gets a destroyed car back. If he had insurance, great. If he doesn't, nothing. So it doesn't take a, a, a rocket science to f scientist to figure out that this system is broken, and I think, you know, when the Antichrist is going to be preaching Bible version or Bible verses, probably from the NIV, this is probably in there. He's probably going to say, hey, we need to go back to this. We're living in lawlessness, which is an NIV word. It, it, this is not part of the sermon at all. But I would watch out for a better system, but just be careful who's, who's delivering it. You know, we'll wait for Jesus' system. Thank you very much. So the next one here, and I, I want to make sure I'm on track for time. The next one is perjury, lying in court. A Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. Keep a finger in Exodus. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What does it mean to, to, to commit perjury? It means you're basically lying in court. You're giving witness in court. Deuteronomy chapter 19, let me just read it for sake of time, verse 16. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is, shall stand before the Lord, before the priests, and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be found a false witness, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And here's the key I want to focus on, verse 20. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. Again, this is something that is basically a, a stab at our government. But what this is saying here is that if you commit false witness, you say a classic example of this, for example, it would be a, like a false claim of rape, which rape is a horrible sin. And, and, you know, I could preach against that all day. But it's, it's interesting where, you know, my brother, who, my brother was a football player. He went and he had a, a scholarship for the University of Wyoming. He played quarterback for four years. And his name is Tom Thornton. And uh, my brother had to take a class from the university saying, hey, you're here on scholarship. You're going to be, you know, on television. You're going to have this football stuff. And he had to take a class 
about making sure that he wasn't falsely accused of, of rape, which is horrible. I mean, the whole football team had to take this class because of other colleges and other stuff. And, you know, I don't want to get into that. I don't really support it. But the point is here is that if we had this system, if somebody falsely accused you of rape, the punishment for raping somebody is to be put to death. Well, if it was proven to be false, then the person who falsely accused you, they get the punishment as if they had committed this crime that they had accused you of. So they would be put to death. So th again, this whole system of, of judgment would save everybody a lot of money because one hand, you're going to fear people, don't do it, don't false accuse, and also don't rape people. I mean, it'd be one and the same. So <coughs> this is, a, this is a, a, a good example of you know, people not committing false witness and why they shouldn't do that. You'd save on legal fees, and this is exactly, bearing false witness just so happens to be exactly what the Jews tempted or bribed the soldiers with Jesus' body. The, the Bible records in Matthew that the soldiers gave, sorry, the Jews at that time, the Pharisees gave the soldiers a lump sum of cash, a lump sum of money to lie and bear false witness about stealing the body, the disciples coming and steal the body, which has been, you know, uh, propagated, that lie has been propagated even to this day. So let's change the gears. Let's talk about uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. I'm I titled this one, Keeping Up with the Joneses. What does that mean? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Now this sermon, is, this would be a great topic for a whole sermon. Thou shalt not covet. Americans typically have a problem with covetousness. What does that mean? Covet covetousness means that you have to have something nice. You know, <laughs> I don't know if you caught on this, to this yet, but Apple releases a brand new iPhone every year. You don't have to have it. You don't need it. It's this, I mean, get the last year's version. Get the older one. Uh, what you can do to avoid this, I mean, covetousness. This means you have to have the nicest thing. Your neighbor gets a new car, I'm going to get a new car. Your neighbor gets a new house, well, I want to get a new house, a new roof or whatever. What we can do here is we can, you know, not have the latest fancy shoes, tech gadgets, whatever. We can shop at Goodwill. We can buy a used iPhone. There's nothing wrong with that. Buy a 10-year-old reliable car. Pay cash. Buy a small house that meets your needs. Live below your means. There's plenty of ways you can do this. And the key thing here is not to covet. You say, well, Brother Jake, how do you know if, you're, if I'm coveting or not? Well, it's real simple. The, the easiest way to explain it is, is kind of like, uh, well, it's kind of like this. It's, it's like if you need a new car, say you're 16 years old, you're thinking about buying your first car, and you say, well, I'm in the market to buy a car. Do you have the money to buy the car? Yes, I do. I've got my lump sum of money. I'm in the market to buy a car. I need to buy a car. I've got the money to buy a car. Now I can start shopping for cars. But once you buy that car, you don't have the money to buy another car. You're not in the market to buy a car. You don't need another car. So if you were to say, wow, I wish I had that car, you're coveting. And this could be applied to basically anything. You know, if you're in the market, if you have the need, you can say, well, I'm going to shop around. I'm going to look at this car, compare it and compare it. But as soon as that need's been satisfied, it would be coveting. If you have a phone, you don't need another phone. Wow, I want your phone. You don't need one. You already have one. <coughs> Uh, Matthew chapter 6, lay up, Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, we need to have treasure in heaven. Our treasure should be our eternal rewards in heaven. That's what's really important. <coughs> So, here's an interesting one. Go ahead and turn with me to, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Make your wife a homemaker. This is something really interesting. Basically, uh, I, this is a common experience I've seen many times where uh, a man, we kind of touched on this this morning, a man goes to work, he provides for his family, but the family says, well, we want to have kids, and they have kids, and then they say, well, but my wife can make a little income too, let's send the kids to daycare. And I love it when people preach against this. Don't send your kids to daycare. Stay at home. You'll actually save more money staying at home. And I've seen people where it comes down to an even wash. They, they, they look at the money. You know, the cost of daycare is expensive. Many of you probably don't know that, but the daycare is very expensive. And then if you apply the other cost, le let me just look at this. The, the cost of daycare is normally about the same as the wife's income. Statistically, it's about the same. 
If you add in the extra commute, so now you need two cars. If you add in her extra wardrobe, she needs to have her business attire and her regular clothes. If you add in for the fact that the kids are in daycare, don't care, and now they're getting sick all the time, because that's where kids always get sick, now you've got all these extra uh, fees, doctor visits, you know, extra sort of sickness, the sick time from work, the stress of driving all around. Having your, t your wife stay at home will save you money. And, you know, don't get me started on, I mean, we're just talking about the financial aspect. The other aspect would be your kids would go to public school, you know, they get polluted by the world. Uh, I recently have found out that the kids in the public school are being taught uh, SEX education from, uh, in kindergarten. So you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to send them to public school. So <coughs> have your wife stay at home. You'll, you'll save more money. Now let's just talk ab about a few things for, for women here. Fancy clothes. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women, becometh women professing godliness with good works. And every husband said, Amen. <laughs> what this is saying here is that a, a woman should not be, a, a Christian woman should not be so concerned about the way she looks. She should dress humbly. And she should be dressed or clothed in good works, having a meek and quiet spirit. You know, we kind of talked about that this morning. Um, I'm going to go forward for sake of time. Let's talk about movies, TV, and music. This is a big thing. I, don't, I didn't calculate how much the world spends on this, but I can imagine the world spends a lot of money on movies, TV, and music. Does anybody know how much a Pandora subscription is these days, or Apple Music, or whatever? Ten bucks a month? Yeah, that adds up. Ten bucks a month, and you know, a net people usually have a Netflix subscription. That's it was seventy nine, seven ninety nine the last time I checked, like five years ago. <laughs> but these things add up. The price of going to the movies. I don't know if you can even do that with the virus anymore. But that's you know, for two people, that's probably twenty dollars or more. Twenty dollars for a movie. I mean, if you think about how much you make on an hourly basis, the movie's two hours long. You're thinking, wow, this is adding up pretty fast. I better work some more. You know, you can save a lot of money by just cutting out all of this stuff. And I probably would, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but I bet a lot of people here have cut out TV, movies, and music. Let me just read for you a few verses. Uh, don't turn there for sake of time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, unclean thing, and I will receive you. As Christians, we're commanded to be separate from the world. What does that mean? That means we shouldn't see you going to the rock concert, you know, with the lighter out. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be down there. You shouldn't be, you should be separate from the world. You shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't be driving home. You know, sometimes we like to drive down Mill Avenue, which is in Tempe, just to look at the Christmas lights. And usually we regret it because it's just like bars and people puking and just the music, you know, that bump, bump, bump. And anyways, we drive down there and just to look at the Christmas lights and the lights are nice if you look up. But the point is, we don't want to see you walking around from bar to bar, you know, puking your guts out or whatever. You're supposed to be separate from the world, amen? You're supposed to be separate. And, but the same thing goes with what you allow in your home. If you're going to, you know, what's the difference if you don't watch it on a, on a on, you know, pay the premium to go into the theater, but you wait six months and you watch on the Netflix or you watch it whatever, you know, watch it, you know, the cartoons or, or whatever it is. It's supposed to be separate. Uh, James 4.4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This means that if there's some sort of, you know, you know, at work, maybe there's a water cooler and everybody's talking about the latest TV show, you should be like, well, man, I don't even own a TV. What are you, what are you guys talking about over there? You know, the Survivor Challenge or whatever. I used to watch Survivor. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I don't know if people even buy uh, iPods these days or if they even per purchase MP3 players, but all you need is the hymnal. You sing the songs to the Lord. Have a melody in your heart. I mean, that's the way to do it. That's the way to live the Christian life. And that stuff is not expensive. It's, it's cheap. And, and the yoke is easy, and the burden is light. Here's a, a fun one, uh, the cost of idolatry. I'm going to summarize this for sake of time, but <laughs> let me read for you 
I'm, I'm summarizing. We know the commandment, don't have any idols. Uh, this is Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. You should, not, you should not bow down yourself to them or serve them, for I am the Lord that God, I am a jealous God. You're not supposed to have any gods before the Lord. This stands for graven images. This stands for, you're not supposed to have any pictures of faggoty, long-haired Jesus. Get rid of that thing. You're not supposed to have any sort of idols, things that you would worship. And it's so interesting because, let me read this for you, Acts 19, verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, this is a false god, brought no small gains unto the craftsmen. That means they made a lot of money. Whom he called together the work with the workmen, live like occupation, and says, Sirs, ye know, by, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! This guy is basically just saying, hey, listen, we're making a lot of money selling these gold statues of Diana of the Ephesians. I always think of like a Coke bottle, some sort of, you know, or, 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 or that, that, that uh, what's that, that award that the, the celebrities get, the, glo the Golden Globes, that little idol thing, some kind of thing like that. Anyway, being a Christian means you don't have to have that gold idol. <laughs> Save your money. It's trash. It's worthless. If anything, it's full of demons which is what we see in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, where they're sacrificed unto devils. So again, being a, a Christian saves you a ton of money. You don't need that idol. And we shouldn't make idols out of other things like an iPad or, or you know, got to have our computer or our phone, always on our phone. You know, you can, just because you're not worshiping it, if you need the thing, you know, you could lose your, it's funny because you can lose your Bible for a day. Where's my Bible? Oh, we'll turn up. But, you, you know, take your phone away, lose someone's phone. I got to find my phone. Got to find it. Where is it? You know, make sure you don't make a, an idol out of your electronics. Now, I think I'm getting short on time. I, I'm probably over on time. Let me just finish with this last one right here. This, I have a lot of these. In fact, let me just read a few of them to you, and then we can finish. I have probably four pages more. I really, I really enjoyed writing this sermon, just, just so you guys know. This was fun for me. The Christian Retirement Plan. I'll just gloss over it. The Christian retirement plan, you know, many people would say, well, you need to save all this money. Save all this money. Why? And they'll say, save it for your retirement. Well, good news for you. If you follow God's retirement plan, you don't need to save all that money for the retirement. The retirement should be your children. Uh, the Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. When Jesus was on the cross, he looked down and he, he sees the disciple there and he says, he sees his mother and he says, Behold thy son. And he says to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But that symbolizes honoring your father and your mother. That means that when you have children, you take care of your children. And over time, as they get older and they begin to go in the workforce and have children of their own, they should have a room for you or a bed for you, someplace in their house where they can take you in. And this defeats the whole purpose of trying to save up all that money for your retirement, which you'd be surprised. And, and it's astonishing to me because you meet someone who's really into their savings, really into their retirement. And there's this thing on the internet, which I've kind of you know, researched a little bit, where it's basically you save up practically like a million dollars in the bank or, or in your stock portfolio, and then you live off 4% of that million dollars. And that comes out to like $40,000 a year. Now, don't quote me on this. I, it's, I don't know what the 4% is. Maybe it's 800000 or whatever. It's a lot of money. But the guy spends all his time saving, he's living on such pennies every year just to give all this money to the bankers so that he can continue living for free on this little money every year. The thing is, just earn up all that money, enjoy it, invest in it, use it as you would, and be, you know, use your, have your children and don't even worry about it. You can't take it with you, friend. What's the point of saving all this money just to live frugally? You're living frugal to live frugal later. It makes no, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you have to make 10 times as much amount, which then you're, you see why people would be getting into dishonest gain to trying to get that retirement. Most of these people who have all this money are probably not saved at all. They're going to go to hell when they die. And I'd rather be poor on earth and rich in heaven any day of the week. So let me just read for you this. Uh, keep your kids out of jail. The cost of a wooden spoon. Keep your kids out of prison. You know, discipline your, your kids. Thou shalt beat. The foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction shall drive it far from them. 
Uh, the commandments to have children, people don't necessarily know this, uh, be fruitful and multiply, God said. That's a commandment. So children are, could be your entertainment. Uh, children, if you have a farm, that's like you know, free labor. We're teaching them through apprenticeship to, to have you know, the farm, and they can work, and they can help you, especially when you're in your old age. Where the oxen are, the crib is clean, but by much increase is the strength of the ox. <coughs> so let me end here. What should we invest in? So hopefully that shows you living a clean life is how you can save a ton of money. And more importantly, a ton of baggage of sin and hard life. The burden is easy. The yoke is light. So with all these savings, what should I invest in? Go ahead and turn for me one more place. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. <clears throat> Let's start reading in verse, oops, sorry, I misspoke. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, a few pages back. Luke chapter 12, let's start reading in <coughs> Let's start reading in verse 16. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And this is Jesus speaking. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there, will, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then those who... Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And he, that, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? This is verse 25. And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye that, and seek ye, sorry, excuse me, and seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful, be of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. What I want to preach on is that, you know, living the clean life here, you've saved, you've saved yourself from all this financial loss. You've saved yourself from all this, you know, horrible stuff. What should you invest in? Invest in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That means invest in a reliable car to drive your family to church three times a week, there and back, there and back. You need it. Your family needs it. They yield the blessings, the spiritual rewards of having your children in church, a great church like this one. It's going to pay off much more in heaven, much more than the price of gas. You won't even remember it. The, the price of that wooden spoon, for example, you know, that's so cheap, but, but it will save your children out of hell. The invest, what should invest in? Invest in, in the airplane tri trip, uh, the airplane ticket to the nearest missions trip. Invest in those things. Invest your time. In the soul winning time, you know, you know, once a week or, or more than that. Take your time, take your money, invest in these things. I've glossed over it here, but there's coming a time when, you know, the Antichrist will come and, and you won't be able to buy or sell anymore unless you take the mark of the beast in your, in your head or your hand. And I pray no one here takes it, you know, amen? Don't take it. And so what should you do? You know, maybe it's time to, you know, have a few extra hard copy Bibles around. Not for you, but for somebody else. 
Maybe it's time to have a tent just in case you've got to flee to the next city, you know. There's, there's, there's certain things you can do with your money now. My grandmother, you know, the, the one that uh, smokes five packs a day, I learned a valuable lesson from her, and she told me that she doesn't think of money as money. She thinks of money as fun coupons, basically meaning that she goes and spends them and has fun, which is, a, you know, she's talking to a child at that point. But she calls money fun coupons. This is the same woman who speeds up at red lights and slows down at green lights because you never know when it's going to change. She, she takes money as fun coupons. What we need to do is take money and say, these things are valueless. They're worthless to me. Let me go trade them in for some spiritual rewards. Let me go trade them in so we can keep the church running and keep you know, Pastor Anderson going and, and, and Brother Corbin and, and the, the faculty. Trade these, these spiritual fun coupons for Bibles to be able to hand someone when you go out soul winning. <laughs> I was soul winning with a guy. He got the guy saved. Do you have a Bible? No. Here, take my Bible. He gave him his soul winning Bible. And he just sat down. <laughs> He's like, I'm done. Like, I found my Bible. Don't be that guy. Take two Bibles. Have two to give out. So take your money and invest it in the Lord. Seek ye the kingdom of God. And you don't have to worry about all these things. And this sermon is meant to be fun. I had fun writing this, talking about all the savings. These are automatic savings. Living the Baptist life, you get these things automatically. You don't even care about them because you've already signed up to give your life, you know, to, to, to pick up your cross daily, to lose your life. For his sake, I'm not talking about salvation. You don't have to give your life to go to heaven. He gave his life to give to you. So let's make sure that we, we give God our money. And I've, I've gl I skipped over the tithing aspect, but tithing is important. We need to make sure that we uh, serve God and not mammon. Let's pray.